Welcome back, everyone. On today's episode, we're talking about a topic that I don't think is a lot of fun, but it is important. Layoffs. Layoffs, I think, are every provider's worst nightmare. You're going into work, doing your job, working a normal work week, and then on a Friday evening, you get a you get a little message to meet in a different room, and there you find your HR manager and your boss, and they tell you that your efforts are no longer needed at the company. You're laid off. All of a sudden, you're unemployed in a heartbeat. In a matter of minutes, you go from having an expected salary that's providing you income and stability to all of a sudden feeling very unsettled and not knowing what to do. In this video, I want to address what I think is a problem that's starting to brew. It's going to be a bigger problem in the future. This is the coming layoffs. Netflix just announced another 300 positions being cut. Not good news from Netflix. And this is their second round of layoffs. And this is Netflix a good company that's laying off employees like crazy. We have Warner Brothers Discovery cutting a thousand jobs, thousand jobs from another highly profitable company. But again, they're, they're deciding to cut down on the workforce and more and more to add to that list. We'll be going over some more of them in this video. But what I really wanna do is not only go over why I think there's gonna be a lot more layoffs in the future, but I wanna go over how to prepare. My advice on this subject, not only how to prepare to avoid getting laid off and trying to be one of the ones that sticks around when a company does cuts, but also how to prepare in the instance that you are laid off and finally what to do if you find yourself in that situation. So we'll be going over all my advice on I think this important topic and I really think that this video could come in handy. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, before we jump into the topic of layoffs, I have to do a quick portfolio update. This is tradition on this channel. We do things real here. I share my portfolio transparently every single week, come good or bad, whether or not we're making money or losing money. This portfolio at one point in time was $20,000 in the green. Right after starting it, it just bumped up to 20,000. Now it's in the red by 40,000. So it was fun to show it off when it was $20,000 in the green, now it's just, you know, it, it bites showing it off when it's $40,000 in the red. But this is the case right now. We've invested a total of 129,000 and we're down 39,300. If you do the simple math on that, that means we're down around 30% of invested capital. So it's gone down a little bit less than the QQQ, but quite a bit more than the S&P 500. That's been the performance overall. If we compare this directly against the S&P 500 as a benchmark, this is what it looks like. SPY is currently down 5% from my initial uh, inception. And then we have this portfolio down 28.69%. So both of them are performing poorly, but my portfolio is certainly underperforming the index right now. If I was a hedge fund manager, this would be very problematic because I'd be managing other people's money. They'd be asking me questions like, what's going wrong? What are you doing, right? But luckily, I'm not a hedge fund manager. I'm not managing anyone else's money but myself. So that relieves a lot of pressure for me. I have time on my side. I'm not beholden to anyone else that has short-term focuses that alter my priorities. Time is the ally of great companies. Time is the enemy of bad companies. So when I'm holding good companies, time is on my side. The longer I'm able to hold these companies, the better my future expected returns are. The lower the price goes for the companies as I continue to buy them, the better my future expected returns. So even though it's difficult to see these stock prices come down with the rest of the market, I view this as an opportunity and I'm continuing to buy into these companies. I'll be buying a few more of them and I wanna highlight which ones I'm really looking at. We have a couple that I think have moved into the value territory. They're no longer even considered real growth companies. Now they're considered value companies. Netflix and Meta. Netflix and Facebook are now value companies. They're not growth. Take a look at this. We have Netflix right here. Using Qualtrum Insight, this website is available to Patreon members. But Netflix now has a market cap of 79 billion, a Ford PE ratio of 15, lower than the S&P 500. This is in value territory after its incredible drop this year. It's down 70% in price. Then we have Meta. This is another company that is a value company, not a growth company. It's trading at a PE of 14. And if you actually strip away their cash and add that to the PE, if you add that away from the market cap, this company's trading more in line at like a 12 PE. It is incredibly cheap right now. Both of those companies I think have moved into the value category. We also have Alibaba, which I think is also being valued right now as a deep value company. Um, and then we have other companies that are still growth company valuations, 
but they've come down significantly in price. One of the most dislocated companies out of the big tech companies is Amazon. This one's come down 30%. My average cost basis for Amazon right now is 152. So that's my cost basis for it. Right now it trades at 110 and I want to buy more of this company. So I am going to be allocating more money, buying a little bit more Amazon if it drops down into the low 100s again, and I'll probably be buying more Facebook. I'll be looking at even buying more Netflix, but I might wait until their next earnings report just to see what happens with that one. Another company that I think is really good value right now is Google. Google's trading at a 19 Ford PE ratio. So it's a little bit above the market. It's not extremely deep value, but Google's a really good company. It has no debt. It has an incredible balance sheet. It has a wide moat. That's what's considered right now. And I do agree with that. They have a pretty significant moat. They have really great assets like YouTube as well that are outside of their core business of Google search. So when I do valuation work on these companies, I think a lot of them are trading at very conservative valuations now. A lot of the excess or the fluff or hype, whatever you want to call it, that was in the stock prices maybe seven months ago, I think most of it's been taken out. These companies trade at very reasonable conservative valuations, I think even from a conservative skeptic investor. We can look at articles like this. Facebook, Netflix, and PayPal are now value stocks. They're literally being introduced into the Russell Value Index. So these companies are no longer trading as growth stocks, they're trading as value stocks. And I still think that many of them are fast growing companies that will continue to grow at the pace of a growth stock, but right now they're trading at the valuation of a value stock. So that's how I look at it. I, I don't know what direction the market's gonna go again in the short term, but I'm still very bullish on each one of these companies over the next five years. Now let's go ahead and move on to the main subject of today, which is layoffs. The first thing I wanna say on this topic is that in my opinion, it's inevitable. It's like Jon Snow saying winter is coming. Layoffs are coming. They're going to happen, I believe, at a very accelerated pace. We just went through a very unique time period where we didn't only have the Fed, but we also had the central government giving economic and fiscal stimulus to every company and every employee, every individual, all at the same time. Money galore. Everyone has infinite money, right? That was the case for just a short window, a very short period of time. The stipulation, the big contract with the government to get these loans forgiven was that you had to keep your employees employed. That's how you got those stimulus and PPP checks. Now, that is gone. That excess demand is gone. That fiscal stimulus is completely gone. Now companies are in a situation where all these employees have bid up their wages higher and higher and higher during unique and very short-lived window of excess demand for employees. And now these employees are very expensive and the companies aren't seeing the same demand that they used to see. Many companies that had explosive growth during the pandemic are now reverting back to the mean. And as their revenue is slowing and all the metrics of the company are slowing, so is their expenses. And they need to alter their expenses to meet their revenue and the rest of the metrics of the company. Netflix is a great example of this. Netflix begins the second round of 300 position cuts. So if we go into this, they laid off another 300 employees. The first round was 150 employees. So again, this is a series of layoffs, not just a single layoff. And then they say this, they say, Today, this is from Netflix themselves. Today, we sadly let go of around 300 employees. While we continue to invest significantly in our business, we made these adjustments so that our costs are growing in line with our slowing revenue growth. We are so grateful for everything they have done for Netflix and working hard to support them through this difficult transition. So this is the key line right here. Uh, the, the part where they say that the, the costs of the company are growing in line with their slower revenue growth. Netflix's revenue growth is slowing, so is their expenses, and they have to cut employees as a result. Now, Netflix is a unique company in that they treat their employees incredibly good, they pay them very, uh, very good salaries, and they pay them a lot of severance. So these employees are going to land on their feet, they're going to have plenty of time to figure this out. They have uh, months of payments ahead of them. Um, Netflix is also reflexive, right? They're, they're doing a lot of things to try to fix their business. One of them is talking with Google about an additional ad supported tear. So this is kind of the chaos that happens with these companies as they go through this transition. We have an economy where there's almost a consensus that GDP and economic activity is going to slow. We have a Federal Reserve that his entire goal and mission is to slow the economy right now to slow things down and lower demand. And 
a way that they do that, a way that companies respond to that slower demand is by cutting back on expenses. One of the most expensive parts, if not the most expensive part of a company are employees. They have high salaries, they have healthcare costs, they have insurance and lots of different things you have to pay for with an employee that you don't have to pay for with so many other things of a company. Now, another company that of course is doing layoffs is Warner Bros. Discovery, another streaming service. They're laying off a thousand employees. That is 30% of their global advertising sales team. And it may not end there. They could lay off uh, 60%, right? 2,000 employees. These numbers could grow a lot, almost exponentially if the economy really does slow down. This is just in preparation of a slowing economy. We also have news that mortgage rates have climbed to above 6% from many lenders. This changes the whole mortgage industry, the whole housing industry. We had layoffs from Redfin. They said that in, in this uh, article from the, this is like a post from the CEO, and I thought it was fantastic, but he goes over how demand may never return to the same levels it was in the foreseeable future for years to come. This was mortgage demand because that's the business Redfin is in. They're in real estate. We also have layoffs in cryptocurrency in the financial realm. Coinbase is laying off 1,100 employees as Bitcoin prices continue to fall. And we also know that Amazon is trying to cut back on hiring as well. They recently overhired and they're trying to actually get rid of employees. Not only that, but they just recently announced their new autonomous robot for the, the warehouses that is distinct from their other robots. Most of the robots in Amazon's warehouse, they're fully functional, but they have to be segregated from the human employees because they might harm a human. This one can work in the same territory, can work right around humans without harming them. That is an incredibly huge leap for Amazon, which makes it much more likely for them to be able to fully automate their warehouses easily to a, a much bigger extent than they do now. These type of changes Going more automation means they have less need for employees that have become a growing expense. Amazon employees are forming unions. They want higher wages. They require health insurance. They get injured all the time. They want vacations, you know, all these type of things that robots don't demand. So a lot of these companies are also gonna be moving more to automation as expensive employees become more expensive. And to finally come to the culmination of this, we have different websites that actually track layoffs with a lot of different companies. One of them that's layoffstracker.com has this graph here month over month. And you can see from 2021, the amount of layoffs, this is the amount of companies in blue, and then the amount of layoffs in black, it's spiking, it's going up exponentially. Just over the past three months, the amount of companies that are laying off employees have gone up to a huge extent, 134 companies compared to just four months ago, nine companies. We can look at another website that tracks layoffs, layoffs.fyi, this one shows that there was a big spike in layoffs as we had anticipate in March of 2020 when a lot of companies like travel and restaurants and leisure got shut down because of COVID. That was kind of mandatory, but then things recovered very quickly. People could find work. Now you can see the trend starting to uptick again and there's no COVID. These are just companies simply cutting back on expenses and laying off employees. Now, the point of going through all of this isn't to scare you. That's not the goal of it. It's to paint the picture that layoffs are coming. I really think that there's gonna be more layoffs, but there's things you can do to prepare. And I put together a list I wanna go through and do things to prepare. Now, this is my checklist. This is the type of things I would do to try to prepare for layoffs. So the first thing is to not over earn. This is a mistake I see many employees do. They aggressively push for raise wages too aggressively to the point where they're earning more money than their actual fair market value. And while you might be able to get away with that temporarily, while there's a ton of demand for employees in this huge imbalance, once things start to stabilize a little bit, companies will look at the value every employee is providing, they'll look at the normal market wage that employees should be making, and if an employee should hold a position that's making 60,000 a year, and they're being paid 100,000 a year, there's a good chance that they're gonna have a target on their back. So while I do think that you should try to get, you know, your value, you should try to get paid for what you're doing at a company, not be exploited or anything like that. I also think you need to be careful. Make sure that you're providing more value than your total salary. That'll make it so you don't have such a big target on your back. Because I've talked to actual companies. I've talked to people that own and run companies just yesterday and they said that a lot of the employees that pushed aggressively for wage raises just a year ago, when we were desperate for employees, are going to be the first ones to go. They're currently being laid off right now because they bumped up their wage to a huge extent when we desperately needed them. Now we don't need them. Now revenue is slowing down. And when we look at employees to get rid of, 
Most of the time, it's the ones that really aggressively bumped up their salary. So it's fine to push your salary up, but make sure you can really back it up with the value you provide. If you can't, you are putting a target on your back. So just be careful about over earning. The next piece of advice I have, and this is one that I think I'll get maybe some pushback on, is that you are not special as an employee. Now, you are special as a human, as a person, as one of God's creations. I think that everyone's special. You know, we all have our unique talents and abilities and personality. And I'm sure that all of you offer a lot of value to your friends and family and loved ones. But as an employee, as an employee in the marketplace, you're probably not special. That's the honest truth. And I know that that might be tough on your ego to hear that you're not special as an employee. The big mistake I see a lot of employees making is assuming that their position at a company, the role that they hold, is much more important and critical and meaningful than it actually is. It's much more indispensable. They couldn't possibly let go of me. I'm super important. Look at all the work I do, right? This place wouldn't run without me at this company. As a worker and an employee, you're not that special. You are replaceable. Almost always, almost always, your job is replaceable. There's very few exceptions to that. The company you work for can lay you off at any time, and they will if they need to. If they need to save money and it's their bottom line in jeopardy, they will get rid of your position. No matter how much ego you have, no matter how critical you think your job is, they will get rid of your position. And in most cases, even people that get let go in seemingly critical positions, once they leave the company, the company doesn't burn to the ground. It doesn't crumble under the, the weight of one person leaving. Most of the time they continue to run. Somehow they get by. So don't let your ego lead you to believe that you're more important and special than you are in the workplace. Jobs in most cases are replaceable. There's again, a couple exceptions. Some government jobs, you need to be fired by means. Uh, some teachers, you have tenure, right? There's a couple notable exceptions. But in the, the workplace at large, most jobs are replaceable, even ones where people think that they have exceptional ability or talent. That brings me to the next point on this subject. I've seen high-level employees that held seemingly indispensable jobs at Microsoft get laid off in 2010. Thousands of them got laid off. High-level, talented people incredible experience, remarkable work, right? Really high positions. They got laid off like everyone else. So don't get it in your head that you're different, that you can hold this job and there's no way that you can be let go. The reality is that almost every job at every company can be let go if the company's finances are in jeopardy. And in terms of job security, I hear this word job security. It's basically non-existent. Doesn't exist. There's really no job security. It takes a couple people in a room right next door to you to have a conversation. A couple managers, a couple bosses in a room next door, and then you're fired the next Friday. You're laid off the next weekend. That's all it takes, one conversation. So the idea that you have job security because you've worked there for a long time, uh, you hold some seemingly indispensable position, I think in most cases is a, a fantasy. It's something that people wish they had that they don't really have. Capitalism is brutal. The marketplace is brutal. We've been spoiled for the past couple of years with jobs having demand for employees to levels we've never seen before. This has given, I think, a lot of new people to the workforce the impression that this is how it is. Employers are always wanting my skills. They always want to employ me and the price that they pay me can never be high enough, right? That's typically not the case. This is because of very unique circumstances that I think are coming to an end. So on this point, you are special as a person and a human, but you're not really special as an employee. And you need to know that. You need to have realistic expectations. Nobody, really no one, is exempt from being laid off. Everyone can have this happen, so you all have to be ready. That's something we have to be prepared for. Now, even though we know that we're subject to being laid off in the future, it could happen, that doesn't mean we should panic or have anxiety or be nervous about it. It just means that we should prepare and not procrastinate it. You don't wanna wait until your home is on fire to purchase fire insurance. You wanna have these things ready in advance. And the first piece of fire insurance we should have from being laid off is three months of savings. Three months plus, I would have at a minimum three months of savings. And what a month of savings means is look at the past 90 days of your spending and average it out over a three month period. Include everything, 
everything that you did in the past three months, include that in your savings so that if you get laid off, you could function for at a minimum of three months with no changes to your lifestyle. Now, of course, if you do get laid off, you could probably make some changes, lower some spending on some things, maybe eat out at restaurants less, but at a minimum, you should have three months of normal living expenses saved. This doesn't only help you if you get laid off, by the way. There's lots of studies, lots of data showing this helps you just in normal life, even if you never use this. So with this money, with this savings, don't worry about earning the best interest rate with it. That's really not the point of it. You can put it in a high yield savings account, but the point is that it has to be liquid. This has to be in a liquid account not invested in any type of even short-term investments. Keep it in cash, keep it liquid, earn the 1% or 1.3%, and who cares if you lose a little bit to inflation? The purpose of this money is for stability in case of emergencies. We've again been spoiled for the past couple of years. Things could change, and it's good to be prepared if that happens. This isn't an investment to grow. You have other money invested. In fact, one of the benefits of having three months plus of savings is that you're not so concerned about market downturns. If your stocks go down, you go, you know what, so what? I have a lot of savings. I'm stable, I'm fine. I don't need this money right now. If you invest 100% of your money and carry no cash, if you lose your job while the stock market's going down, which in many cases they do coincide, then you're in a tough situation. Now you're having to sell out of stocks at depressed prices to fund your emergency savings, which you should have already had. That's what happened to a lot of people in 2009. A lot of people lost their job and they had to use their savings, which was their investments, during a time where the market was crashing. The worst time to be withdrawing money. So make sure you have three plus months of living expenses. This one is really important. Another one on this note is to not use leverage. Don't invest on margin. That is incredibly risky to do. It's fun when markets go up, but it can be devastating when markets go down. People get in trouble, financially speaking, with leverage. This is a tool that many people don't anticipate how much it can work against them. It is a double-edged sword and it's very sharp. If leverage works against you, it can cause financial problems you can never recover from, at least for like another 10 years. I've seen people destroy their entire financial net worth by using leverage incorrectly by not actually knowing the risks of it. So unless you have an incredibly specific reason where you're using leverage in a, a not risky way, I think you should avoid it altogether. There's a reason that I have access to $140,000 of margin on my M1 portfolio and I don't use it. It's because I have a stress-free life. I know that if my stocks go down, I can just wait. I'm not gonna be margin called. I don't owe anyone money. It is such an easy position to be in. I invest money that I have and not money that I don't. And I look for companies that do the same things. A lot of the companies I'm investing in have no debt. So they're running their balance sheet in similar fashion to my investing. So when you look at this, try to avoid leverage. Now, there are certain types of debt that in most cases are somewhat unavoidable, mortgage loans. And I don't think mortgages are really bad debt. That's one of the few instances I think is good debt. But car loans can be incredibly high interest rates and incredibly high payments for a long period of time. I see a lot of people taking out way too much debt to buy really expensive cars. Don't do that. Cars are a waste of money in almost every case that I see. People could buy far cheaper cars that do the exact same job, that have the same safety ratings, and they could save themselves from a ton of financial stress and a lot of wasted money in my opinion. So be careful at the amount of debt you're taking out for cars. In my opinion, those are depreciating assets. The fun of a car wears off after a week, but the payments continue on for seven years with insurance on top of it. They are very expensive. So be careful with your auto loans. Try to minimize them. Another thing that you should get rid of is any credit card debt. Wipe that out every single week. If you can't wipe out credit card debt, then stop using credit cards. So that's my advice with leverage. Don't use it in most instances. Be incredibly careful if you do. The only type of debt that I think is good is mostly real estate debt, where you're getting an asset that actually appreciates in value over time. Cars are not gonna appreciate forever. It's a very unique thing that they did for one year. In most cases, they're a huge money black hole. And you don't wanna be investing in margin, in my opinion. I think it's just way too risky. So I'd avoid this altogether. You'll be in much better shape in the circumstance that you find yourself laid off. Now, the next thing that I think is important for everyone to be working on is building a network. This is important because if you know a lot of people in different companies, different industries, different positions, and you're friendly with them, you've worked with them before, uh, you've been colleagues or coworkers with them, that's important because that builds out a network. And the more the, the more of a network you've built out 
in the professional industry, the easier it becomes to find a job. Over my work uh, time period, the first job that I found was very difficult because I didn't know anyone. I just had to kind of do cold calling of finding a job, just finding new people I've never talked to before, convincing them that I'm worth hiring. But every job after that has just been people that I knew and met. They liked working with me previously. They moved on to a different company. So they said, hey, I have a, a job here that I need you for, right? And so I'd get pulled to different companies and better positions. Um, and it always worked out in the benefit to have a large network. A lot of times when it comes down to the workplace, unfortunately, this is the reality. Who you know is often more important than what you know. Who you have contacts with. This is really important. So obviously there's different channels of finding jobs from Slack communities to LinkedIn, building out networks in different ways, or just a, a real network, like real people that you know, you have their phone number, right? There's lots of different ways to build a network out, but I think this is incredibly important. Who you know in the workforce is important. And on that point, you should never burn bridges. This is something that I disagree with a lot of people on. I see a lot of people doing what I think is a self-inflicted wound, which is burning bridges. It might be satisfying, to finally tell that coworker that's been pesky for all those years, to tell him really what you think, right? When you're quitting or when you're being laid off, to finally tell your boss really what you think about him. That might be satisfying, but it accomplishes nothing. And the world is a very small world. You may be in a situation where you have to work with these people once again. And those type of damaged relationships can cause serious problems and even cost you your job. I've seen people that burn bridges before get excluded from future jobs specifically for doing that. So it doesn't work to your advantage. You have to pick, do you want that five seconds of satisfaction or do you wanna have better work opportunities in the future? Because many times you have to choose between the two. And in my opinion, being pragmatic about this, all burning bridges really does is make you feel good, no one else feel good, and it hurts your job prospects in the future. So while I don't think you need to go on LinkedIn and write a big post about how grateful you were to work at a job that you really didn't like, you don't have to do that, but you don't also have to go and mouth off to them and tell them how much you didn't like them after working there. In most cases, it's best to just say goodbye, be cordial, and move on to new opportunities because again, it's a small world. People change, roles change, and you end up working in many cases with the same people in the future. Then the last point I wanna bring up is if you're laid off, don't be distraught. It's not the end of the world. It's not something to be super concerned about. It can be difficult and I will acknowledge People in this situation, I don't envy it, right? This is a difficult thing to go through because you have anticipation of just working at a company and everything's going fine, then all of a sudden things change. If it happens, just be persistent. That is the biggest thing that will get you back into a new job. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Follow up on your applications. Tailor them for the job that you're looking for. Again, follow up with your contacts, your network. If you did all these things beforehand, you are well prepared to be laid off in the future and there's no reason to panic for it. So these are things that overall, when I look at the potential for layoffs happening in the future and preparing for that, I really think this is the best advice. So I thought this would be worth the share. I know it's a little bit of a departure from my normal videos, but I think this is an important topic because I've looked at the analytics. Many of us are in the workforce. Most of us actually watching this are in the workforce. So we have to deal with this stuff and I think it's good to talk about it. But that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this video and got value out of it. If you have different opinions or you disagree on any of this, let me know in the comment section and I'll see you in the next one.